losing motivation to get things done. I am exhausted and hopeful. I am the life, death, life, nature. I am a swarm of rats. I am becoming the woman I've always wanted to be. I am terrified and excited. I wonder what people are doing to feel okay. I wonder if this matters to anyone but me. I wonder if there ever was democracy in America with a K. I wonder what I will think of myself now as the years pass. I hear passing cars, wind passing through the trees. I hear chirping, actual birds instead of my iPhone birds. I hear blood in my own head, the luxuriantly problematic loam of existence. I hear wind chimes ringing in my ears. I, I see people floating by without being able to grab onto any of them. I, I see trees like Tuscany and New Depths. And I remember the same walls. I want confidence. I want to elicit some sort of real change in my life. I want to stop treading water. I want to nut up or shut up. I want someone to tell me what the future holds. I want a green new deal. I want liberation. I want to feel at ease and safe with people I can trust. <sighs> I'm afraid of how much I depend on others. I'm feeling lost in my new environment. I'm trading my body for capital. I am quantized by productivity. I am the mistaken zygote, a pile of unrelated objects passing as a whole human. I am often sleepy and passive, occasionally aggressive. I pretend like I know what I'm talking about. I pretend like I don't know when you're not being truthful. I pretend my schizoanalytic logic is pure. I pretend that I don't need or want anyone and that I know less or more than I do. I sing thinking about you. I sing over the bones. I sing when I'm alone and not paying attention. I, I worry about the time I'm losing with my older family members. I worry that life will return to normal. I worry that I won't find what I need here. I worry about my true capabilities and that people won't tell me when I'm wrong. I worry that greed will destroy everything we have known. I worry about everything and everyone all the time. I worry that I'm making bad choices and starting bad patterns. <sighs> I cry for the loss of my former creative, emotional, and physical outlets. Tears are a river that take you somewhere. I cry hardly ever. Not since March 14th in the gender-neutral bathrooms in the basement of Marionetti. I am slowly detaching from myself. I am permanent impermanence. I am hopeful. I understand that there will all be, always be some sort of disconnect. I understand that as one abandons worn out clothes and acquires new ones, so the, when the body is worn out and, and a new one is acquired by the self dwelling within, I, I understand that nothing is black and white and that solutions are never absolute. I say, give the universe time to rearrange itself and grant your request. It's a tall order. I say that all things get better with time. I say that people need to feel safe. I say I can handle this. I say what shall I celebrate now? I say what I am remembering as I take in the presence. I dream of sleeping. I dream of the cataclysmic joy of living, the permanently unforeseen and marvelous catastrophe. I dream of infestations and people that I won't admit I care about. I try to find new purposes in the objects in my environment. I, I try to sit with myself. 
I try to practice forgiveness with myself. I try a prayer that escapes from between my teeth. I try to take in what people tell me to to change, to see my current state as temporary. I hope that it'll be okay. I hope that I won't feel lost for much longer. I hope to facilitate growth in others. I hope for permanent and permanence. I hope that life is ultimately fulfilling. I think it's I think it's fucked up that nobody told me that in order to have electricity you have to burn coal, burn natural gas and burn biomass, aka trees, animals and the earth. I think finance is a tough guy sport like rugby or tackle football, suitable mostly for people slightly overdosed on testosterone. I think that everything will always feel the same, but at the same time, we'll never be like this again. I let go of my faith in authorities to lead us. I let go of the desire to be good at everything. I let go of my expectations of the people in my life. I let go of coral reefs. I let go of the idea that my life will ever be what I was told it would be. I let go of 34,850 known species that went extinct between 1900 and 2100. It was and remains ongoing the sixth greatest mass extinction in Earth's history. I let go of trying to be the best and of the idea that anyone is more worthy of being idolized than anyone else. I push for change and development. I push for truth and authenticity. I push to expectorate the vestigial theological superstitions. I push for happiness, for further understanding. I miss my friends. I miss being in a place of growth. I miss the sound and smell of the ocean. I miss drinking espresso at a hushed Viennese coffee house reading Asimov. I miss the way her body pressed into mine, that grip. I miss everything all the time when it was easy to be more romantic. I am afraid of being a partner with a substance abuse. I am a f- lifelong learner. I am grateful. I am lying naked on a block of ice under a heat lamp. I am exhausted with existing, constantly inconsistent. I wish time would slow. I wish things would make more sense. I wish I carried the deity inside my womb. I wish I could think more clearly and understand more. I want to let the sublime and ferocious urge the world needs circulate in my body from top to bottom like the waves of an unleashed ocean. I, I want to surrender to the immeasurable chaos of creation. I want to appreciate what is happening now without retreating to the past or the present. I know every birth, every spiral, every dying star has its place in the universe. I permit every being to be what it is. I know nothing in the grand scheme of things. I am the ephemeral flower always being born of the abyss. I am not others' perceptions of me. I fell into myself, and each time I fell more deeply, I fell in love and out of love every day and easily. I am invigorated. I am powerful. I am confident. I am sweet. Here's the song we know along. You drift out the year. A song that I want to sing. Have you seen the light? I've seen the dark, but you won't understand.
understand. Oh. You see the dark and I see light. No one understands. If you look out in the beauty, you see it all with light. If you stay in towns, walking around, sharing biscuits and flights, I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend a town. I would just go to the forest, make friends with all the animals, learn magic all above, train it, train to be a panda. I wouldn't recommend to have a flight without the trees. Go, you see the light now. Go, you see the dreams. Go, you see the light now. You can look out on there. Go, you see the rainbow. No one sees it too. Go, you see the rainbow. I don't know it well. You don't know it like anyone, but I know it well. Go, you see the rainbow. You know it better. Welcome everyone, my name is Scott Melbourne and I am the director of the Schneider Museum of Art, part of the Oregon Center for the Arts here at Southern Oregon University. Today's Zoom talk is in regards to the video titled Universal Language and the Q&A with the creators. I trust that you all have, uh, you all tuning in um, have watched the video. We opted to do it this way because Zoom was not the best platform form for a large online watch party. This project was led by Hollis Witherspoon, who is a Brooklyn-based performer, teaching artist, and therapist, whose work revolves around collaboration, improvisation, and character studies. She studied anthropology and theater at Princeton, acting at the Esper Studio and Drama ther Therapy at NYU. She teaches in the Fine Arts Department at Pratt Institute, where she created the course Improv for the Artist. She um, also taught a performance here at SOU this past spring. She's been in direct conversation and collaboration with the artist Grayson Cox, who was our spring visiting artist and scholar and teaching resident, or we like to call VAST. Uh, Grayson was here this past spring with Hollis. Um, so to Turn it over to you, Hollis. Anything you would like to uh, say before we get into a little Q and A? Um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's really, to, it's it's lovely to sort of like reconnect with um, everyone from SOU and the Schneider Museum because it was such a formative experience for us to be there, like directly coinciding with the pandemic. Um, so now we're back in New York. And it's just sort of wild to look back and and just notice um, time passing and how strange that is uh, in the last, I guess, six months, right? Yeah, so thanks for having me. Oh, and I wanted to just say, like, some of the people on this call that, uh, that collaborated on this with me, whether they knew they were or not, is uh, Tori and Anahea, uh, Tabitha and Chella, so, and Grayson. And Emily <laughs> and Scott, you know, so all of you. <laughs> um, so thanks for coming for this Q and A. Yes, and for uh, all of those with your question and answers, you can ask directly. You can also type in questions in the chat, in which I could read them aloud for everyone. Um, so right off the bat, does anybody have any um, 
any, any thoughts or questions regarding the, the video? Okay, so to get things a little bit started, um, why don't we go to the inception hollow? So you were here for the spring. Did, were you conceiving some sort of uh, project yourself to take on you know, for the entire term? Was it something that happened organically? Um, can you talk a little bit about that, those inception stages? Yeah, so um, originally when we were coming, you know, it was a long planned uh, residency and teaching appointment at SOU. So we had thought about it since September, um, pre-COVID, and we had planned on coming and, you know, interacting and being there and being part of a community. So my plan really was to dive into teaching performance art and integrating, you know, my work with improv and with play and with movement um, into like a one, a, you know, personal experiential embodied um, relationship with, with students and, and see what came of that. And then quickly we realized that we, everything was going to be online. So, and then we were in a pandemic and we were by ourselves and we were alone and it was very scary. Um, so everything turned on its head. And I have to say, I did not feel particularly inspired or creative or artistic when I arrived in Ashland for at least the first couple months because we were just like the rest of the country and the world, really scared, really scared and really disoriented, um, trying to figure out how to, how to move forward just in like the day-to-day -day life. Um, and, you know, stress and creativity, I think are sort of natural enemies. So I was just processing a lot. Um, I was really inspired by my students' work though. I just found them like really adapting quickly and making work and, and challenging and asking questions and um, and just participating in this discussion, participating in this process with me. So from then I was, I, I, I sort of became inspired to sort of think about like what our shared experience might look like. And then separately, um, Grayson had built a studio, uh, an installation in the museum with a thousand iced coffees and our daughter, our six and a half year old daughter and I and Grayson spent hours every day like making these fake iced coffees and setting them up for no one, right? Just for ourselves. So we spent a lot of time just like wandering around this museum and wandering around uh, the art building at SOU as if we owned the place and no one else was there. It was really strange. It was kind of like being in a castle by yourself, like a kid in a castle. So I, I was inspired by that. I wanted to do something, um, something movement oriented in the space around the iced coffees. And then of course, Ashland itself is so beautiful and inspiring and naturey. And um, I, I wanted to sort of process my feeling of exploring as well. So it kind of dual but parallel processes. Mm -hmm. So you were coming into SOU with some experiences uh, working with art students, uh, teaching improv for the artists at Pratt. And this mm -hmm. performance class, the first, I, I don't know, I, can, I cannot think of any other time where SOU was teaching a performance class. And it kind of stemmed out of, you know, the faculty were seeing some students um, being interested in performance as a, a, an art form. Um, and then also um, uh, you coming here with Grayson for Grayson's uh, residency seemed like a perfect opportunity to launch a performance class. Uh, you just talked about last minute everything going online. How do you teach a performance class um, through this, through Zoom? Well, you get creative and you rely a lot on video as like documentation for the work. Um, it, it was really challenging because my work with artists up until this point has been like so experiential and ephemeral and like capturing the moments that we exist together and I'm interested in that experience. Um, so then we had to sort of like translate it into how do we document our processes and share them and I thought it was quite successful actually to because everyone produced videos um, and, and then we also produced some experiences I remember we did a class on happenings and um, and someone, uh, one of the students like made a list of, 
of of instructions and so that everybody like left their building and went out and like collected something and then put it together and then sent it to someone else in the class and I felt that like that that's an experience that is worthy of exploring even when we're on zoom we can still have experiences individually and shared um and yeah I think I think it's just an opportunity to be more creative mm -hmm. You also just uh, briefly spoke about our students here at SOU uh, being able to adapt uh, quickly to what was going on in the world. Um, not looking for an SOU plug, but after teaching at a top ranked private arts school and then coming here with SOU, um, you know, where, where do you think our students uh, felt? Like you, you, you know, had some kind words, but can you talk a little bit about what you you saw? Uh, maybe like a compare and contrast between such programs. Sure, I'll I'll plug SOU. I was I was really pleasantly surprised, and or I guess not surprised. I don't know. I was surprised at like how people how receptive anyone would be to suddenly working over the internet with someone they'd never met before, um, who who wasn't necessarily familiar with the context that they were working from. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that at Pratt, it's a very international community. So I'm constantly adapting my class um, to be considerate of, of different cultural experiences and different language um, experiences. And I don't know, I, I also found that SOU students came from a lot of different contexts and, and I was really delighted that um, there wasn't a sort of like uniform demographic of like I'm a I'm a 20 year old you know sophomore or whatever. Everyone came really with different life experiences and unique perspectives, and um, I think really held on to their authenticity and explored their authentic selves, even if it was very different than the rest of the groups. If that makes sense. So. I also just, you know, it's great when people are hungry for information and curious about things. So it was very cool for me to like introduce, you know, someone like, um, I don't know, like Marina Abramovich that, that might be really familiar in performance art, but it's, it's sort of like wild to, to learn about her for the first time. And I had that experience when I learned about her for the first time. So to be able to translate and share that was really, really cool. Um, this pandemic is unprecedented times for multiple generations. Um, did you find that your background uh, uh, in regards to being a therapist and working in, in therapy techniques um, contributed to your uh, teaching sensibilities? Yes, yes, for sure. I mean, I think that it, it's a tra it's a traumatizing or traumatic time in history right now for so many different reasons. Um, everybody's under a tremendous amount of stress and I was under a, a, a amount of stress and I think there's a certain um, sort of like existential layer to it of like what is happening who's in charge what's what will the future be like is this is this it um, so there's a lot of themes that I felt like I was experiencing and I felt like I could name I think sometimes in academics even rightly so I think people or teachers can be afraid of getting too emotional or getting too, you know, certainly getting too therapeutic, but sort of naming the experiences that they're having or being really vulnerable, we're asking that of their students. And I felt like there was no other option other, to, other than to sort of talk about like, this is what's happening, let's create like, yeah, let's create space for the fact that um, people are dying right now or the fact that uh, there's systemic violence in our country right now, or that, you know, all these issues that were coming up over the semester, um, we can't, there, we can't sort of separate them from how we go about life and how we, certainly how we go about making art. So to me, that was incredibly critical, just to be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Just continuing a little bit with the sort of like foundational fundamentals of this course and these experiences, which led to the, the video piece. 
Um, are there any students on this call that would like to um, add or, or share their experiences of going into this um, you know, first off SOE performance course? Thank you. Hey, Tori. Um, yeah, I, I took this performance art class because I, I'm like new to art period, but just performance art was something that I had never even really thought about. And like meeting Hollis and, and learning about everything in that class really made me understand that it's like so boundless. And um, <laughs> something that I was just talking to Chella about, and Chella was also in that class, was that one of the few things that I remember um, in quarantine or like in that whole quarter was there was this one class um, that was happening the day of one of the protests uh, when all the Black Lives Matter protests were happening. And Hollis was like, we're not going to have class today. We are just going to like play music and stretch. And when I watched your video, Hollis, uh, that you made, it like, it was just like all of that emotion. It just like, it was like all of our shared emotions. It like, it was like so perfect. And it's so like, I just like, I loved it so much. And it just kind of like brought me back to like that feeling of like sharing all of these thoughts and feelings that were just like so hard and confusing, but like seeing it and like seeing it somewhere that's like so close to home. Like you went to like all of the places in Ashland that I think mm -hmm. are like so beautiful and just like, it was confusing and like visceral and incredible. And that class was just like really, really incredible. So, um, thank you. Thank you, thank you for sharing, sharing Tori. Um, any other students would like to share their experiences? Um, yeah, I'd like to talk. Um, something that uh, me and Tori just had a conversation where we kind of agreed on all that. So like I second everything that Tori just said, but something that was really powerful to me through that experience was like, as you said, we were all like quarantined in our houses. We had never met you. Like me and Tori both had like transferred here that year. We didn't know many people. And like mm -hmm. by the end of the term through like learning this new art form and just like being humans together, you like created this like, it's such a vulnerable piece of work. And just to, like to hear you, someone we've never met, never seen in person, like speak all these things that we were like writing while we're like freaking the heck out in our rooms in quarantine was really incredibly powerful. Thank you for Thank sharing. You. Uh, so maybe a little bit about um, how this came to be Hollis and you know, Kayla was just talking about uh, the students creating some writings um, mm -hmm. and then being shared. Can you talk a little bit about these beginning stages? Yeah, so so every week we have a sort of assignment or a prompt, and I want it to be very open ended. I'm I'm very, you know, I, I'm as a as a teacher, I learn as much as I teach, right? Because I'm always learning about people's processes and how they do things. Um, so all the assignments were pretty open ended. There was like a prompt, and then every week people would come and share what they'd made, and um, I I just started thinking like what is our, what is the shared experience, you know, and I, I didn't, I didn't know how to um, capture that or, or sort of commandeer that all by myself. So I, I was thinking about ways to create something collaboratively and organically. And so I started, I just created this series of prompts um, based on sort of like an I am poem and I am poem is, you know, I am I, I will, I want to be, I, I, you know, it's just, it's very simple prompt sort of locating the self in any given moment. And it really is about a moment. It's not like I am, you know, this for 10 years. It's like, I am this like right this second. And I believe in like the multiplicity of selves and roles that we all play. So I was curious, you know, what was going on um, with everybody and with me. So I, I offered up this Sort of series, long series of prompts, and I filled in some myself. I can't even tell you what which part I wrote because I do feel like they sort of all organically melded together. And then students, um, the students in my class, um, 
anonymously wrote over a period and contributed responses to these prompts over a period of a couple weeks, I guess, or maybe even a month. And, and I didn't look at them. I didn't check at it. I didn't, I didn't see how it was progressing. Uh, but by the end, there was this just gorgeous poem that existed that felt like its own complete narrative and, and could have happened at many different phases and moments of the day and could have happened in response to each other or not. Um, and it, I didn't change a thing. I didn't change a word. Even There were even some parts that I didn't sort of understand if I was interpreting them right or getting them right, but I just kept it as is because that's what was and there's no mistakes. Um, so that's, so that's how the writing came about. And then, and then it was a sort of totally separate process to shoot it. Grayson, who's on this call, shot it. Um, and my, my daughter made all the music wandering around the Schneider Museum by herself, just kind of singing. Um, yeah. So that's how we made it. Yeah. I was just going to ask about that, the, the mechanics, the cinematographer, videographer, audio, um, you know, pandemic times, we're not getting large groups together. So this was made in collaboration with your students, your partner, Grayson, your daughter. Um, Emily. Emily McPeck. Works who with edited it, who was incredible, made the whole thing, shaped the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I say one thing? Of course. Um, I, so, um th this also kind of came out of another th some other projects but one in particular when we happened to be teaching in um, Venice Italy and decided that hey we're we're here and why not go get a bunch of footage here and Hollis came up with an immediate idea to for, or excuse to go out and get footage and then we um, produced a video that we're still working on now um, uh, but that so that once we were in Ashland there was our we had already had this kind of uh, method or way of making something where um, we would just go around and film and not put too much pressure on it yeah it's, it's the why the hell not method and and really it's like why not why not do this like we should do this why not do this yeah. and then you just sort of don't talk yourself out of it well i would i would say it's more than a why not uh to commit yourself um you know to be in public um you know with the eye mask you know the nightgown you know on the streets crossing the streets um that's that's quite a commitment and uh Pretty, pretty brave. I, I'm sure your um, you know, background in acting has really permitted that. And, um, you know, which leads me to uh, perhaps one of your students put in the uh, chat a comment with, I agree with Tori. Hollis really encouraged me to explore my true art self. It was a beautiful experience. I feel more comfortable now showing myself. I use my I am. Uh, affirm uh, affirmation cards and pick special ones for Hollis in the class. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Tabitha. And just a reminder, if you um, have any questions or any comments to put in the chat, I'm happy to read those off. Um, or if you have any questions you would like to, to ask on camera, everybody can uh, do so uh, at their will. I want to say something too about that. You know, I, I spoke to a um, creative writing class the other day, a Craig Rice creative writing class, and they had some really interesting questions, one of which was like, why, why, like, how could you show so much of yourself? And um, for me, it was a translation process. Like, I don't think that I, if I had written those words, I would have been brave enough or felt comfortable enough um, to sort of reveal myself that vulnerably I think that it it was the collaboration that made me feel um sort of motivated to to do it and and we we also shot like all times of days like at one point we woke up at you know 4 30 in the morning and put our daughter in sleeping in the back of the car and like drove around just to get the morning light and then we did like the evening light and there's a shot where I'm 
walking in Lithia next to that pond and there was a man swimming in the pond in that in that like algae cover it was so strange you know and you just have to like go with those moments you just have to let them happen and be there Okay, another and Anu, yeah, Anuhea just wrote something too. Yeah, Hollis, you can read that one. Oh, I, she just said, uh, I constructed a moving class where we were able to connect to each other and each other's practices in a time where school seems so daunting. And this was the one student that I got to meet in person. I finally got to meet someone in person um, from the class, which is so cool because she came to the opening. We showed it in a gallery in Brooklyn um, hmm. a couple weeks ago. And that was that was really awesome to have an embodied like meeting. Anulia, what were you doing in Brooklyn? Um, I was visiting my partner um, and just enjoying the city because I needed it. <laughs> um, and I traveled safely. Um, but meeting Hollis was just surreal. I think um, getting to know someone in their practice throughout a term and then meeting them in real life and realizing it wasn't it wasn't that different. I don't know, it was just really weird um, and really nice to be able to view it in person with um, my partner and came like came with me. And it was just, it felt like a full circle kind of thing um, because we had all been so vulnerable with each other in that class. Um, and I got to witness it with someone who was very influential to me during the time of that class. And so it was just really, it was a surreal experience. Very nice. <laughs> very well, refreshing during this time. I, I loved that um, one of our students from SOU was part of the class, part of the project, uh, was able to pop in uh, during its uh, showing in Brooklyn. That's pretty incredible. I know. During a pandemic, no less. Such commitment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Next time, we will bring everybody. Yeah, field trip to Brooklyn. I'll, I'll show you all the good spots. Mm -hmm. So getting into the performance, into the, the video work, um, you know, you talked about the going to the sites, uh, different sites. Are these sites that you had previously um, experienced on your own before even thinking about creating a video? Um, you know, were these sites loaded in, in some way? Um, mm -hmm. Were these sites uh, students referred to in the class and you made note of, or a combination of all of the above? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, the whole thing started in the Schneider Museum because we spent a lot of time in there helping Grayson, you know, install this piece, um, just us in this like cavernous museum space. And uh, I got the idea of like, what would it be like to sort of navigate these iced coffee cups, like without being able to see? That's what it feels like right now. <laughs> it's like wandering through um, debris, so to speak, um, blindfolded. and. Uh, and then I was like, no, I want to go. Out, I want to go outside after this. And so there was a sort of natural progression. I was trying it, initially. I was trying to make sense of a sort of narrative journey that led me almost like in a dream outside the museum, all through the town, and then back again. And because of the way that we ended up editing, or Emily ended up editing it, um, a lot of those pieces got separated, which which was totally fine. Because if you if you don't know those places, it it might not matter. I mean, if you do know those places, it might, you might wonder, like, why is she jumping all over town? But um, yeah, they were all places that I had been, um, that I loved. And then I found these, like, really interesting spots, like, you know, that, that weird parking lot on a hill overlooking the whole town, right? Or um, I, I knew sort of early on that I didn't want people around. I wanted it to sort of be this, like, empty quarantine world. Um, I spent a lot of time in Lithia Park just like trying to exhaust myself into, into times where I could sleep at night, right? Because I was, I had a lot of anxiety um, and a lot of times like just walking up those really, really steep hills by myself. And so I sort of discovered these little spots along the way and these like abandoned lots and that there's this a playground near the apartment where we were that had these like weird flower like sculptures, but maybe they were 
play things for children? I don't know. I've never seen a children child play on them. So um, yeah, just like looking for sort of like dynamic, interesting places. And I live in a city with tons of people and lots of concrete. And so to be able to like wander around a natural environment that's so beautiful was incredibly special and, and, and inspiring in and of itself. In the chat, <clears throat> Chela is um, mentioning she has a question. Chela? Um, yeah, I um, for me, that was like the first kind of like collaborative piece that I've ever been a part of. So that's like my kind of my only reference for how you work together to like create something with other artists. And I guess knowing your work, I'm curious about how that compares to other kinds of collaborative works that you've done outside of quarantine, like when, like how, how does like the final product and the ideas of people coming together change when you were doing it remotely and when you've done it in person? And like, can you talk about how that affected the process? Yeah, and I, I, that's a really good question because I, I realized like after I'd started making the piece and, and working with Emily to, to shape it, um, that I didn't give you much information. I basically said like, hey, do you want to work on something with me? And here's some prompts. I didn't tell you what it would be. I didn't tell you my intention because I maybe didn't know the intention. I was just trying to sort of like connect the dots. So um, this is, I think, unique for me in that it really was like a responsive, reflexive process versus like other devised work I've done with people. It, we've sort of had an explicit um, process that we work on together. Uh, throughout the whole thing. Like I, I made a, I wrote a play with someone a couple years ago and it was, it was based on like devi like a devised workshop over like a couple months of like talking about um, the small groups experiences and then like translating in, into like a fable and then writing that together. But always being super, anytime you're making work like that, you have to be super, super mindful of like what you are representing. And I just had this like, to me, to me, there was there was like a sense of purity in that I wasn't changing any words, and and everyone who contributed to that document could see what it was a part of. So there was like choice in it, and there was um, there was a sort of transparency in in that respect. But but I also like wow, I'm sort of blown away by the, like the trust and vulnerability of you guys because. I could have like done something really wild and disrespectful with it. I mean, I wouldn't have, but you know, there, I didn't have anybody like sign off on it, I guess. Um, so that was different. That was new for me. And I didn't know what it would be like. I didn't, I wasn't sure. It was, it was, it was a question for me. Whereas usually I have a much more explicit agenda. And then in my work with like improvisation with people, there's no agenda and there's also no product. So that's different. That's just an experience that we have together. And that's almost like what I'm more comfortable with. So this is sort of a hybrid of the two, if that makes sense, two processes. I've got a question in the chat uh, from Joy, a very basic question. How does, backslash is, how does is performance art differ from a play? Is it hmm. the intention? Is it the process? That's a good question. Um, I'm not a foremost expert on either, but I would say that uh, context is the, is the first thing that I think of, right? Like um, we had a guest speaker in the class who curated uh, comedy shows for PS for MoMA, right? And people were like, well, what makes this art? You basically have a bunch of comedians in a museum space doing a comedy show for art patrons. And she was just saying, you know, it's context. It's, it's introducing two worlds to each other. And I, I kind of think that that's what performance art is. It's introducing performance. The, the modality is your body and your mind and your voice um, into the context of art. And not for everyone, but sometimes I think it's more of like asking a question or doing an exploratory process um, versus a play that is like fully written, fully conceived, fully edited, you know, performance art exists in a moment and then it can disappear and maybe it's um, influenced by a lot of different factors at once, whereas a play and theater is 
is much more fully formed and someone has a cool reference. What we may describe as great range of collaborative type projects. Oh, cooperative vein of collaboration. Oh, cool. Thank you, Michael. That's that's an interesting that's an interesting comment. Yeah. So I think that it's um it's a good question and uh I don't know, maybe it's like an a a matter of experience and control. Mm -hmm. Um, so for anybody here who viewed our summer exhibition celebrating wild beauty in which we saw Grayson's work and there was a, a context for those coffee cups uh, or his interest in the Jugo iced coffee, um, what was the sort of reinterpretation? Uh, what was maybe some of the conceptual ideas running through your head uh, as you were utilizing them in the performance piece? Um, so Grayson, you can jump in on this, but we've had a lot of conversations about the meaning of the iced coffee and done a lot of writing about it. And, I, you know, there's, it, to us, it, I think in the spring, particularly as people were quarantining in their home, but reliant like entirely on these, on these um, conveniences and comforts of like ordering things online on Amazon, um, ordering, ordering takeout because you couldn't go to a restaurant, all, all these sort of like convenient comforts and the iced coffee represents like the ultimate sort of aspirational excessive thing. Like no one really needs an iced coffee. You're taking a very humble thing, which is coffee and then making it cold, which just requires a lot of energy and then diluting it with ice and then using plastic and straws and all these things. And then it costs like $7 and then you drink like a quarter of it. So Grayson, you can speak, you can speak more to this, but the idea of like a thousand iced coffees, right? These like lonely little discarded creatures with no humans around, I think took on a different personality in that space. Yeah, I mean, I was, we were talking, I mean, everything we work on, essentially, the two of us is collaborative. And, you know, we talk through everything. <laughs> um, it it exhausts, you know, like, a lot. And so every day, and so um, a lot of the ideas are coming out of just our conversations and the iced coffee, you know, we, we've talked a lot about as just a material you know, like, you know, there's the ready-made, the Duchamp idea of the ready-made. Um, and I don't see this as much as a ready-made. I see it as just a material where we could use the iced coffee once we filled it half full or whatever with dye um, as a material that could be utilized to, cr to create different situations. And in fact, when Hollis showed the video um, at Five Miles, in Brooklyn, um, she had the idea to make rings around the chairs with the iced coffees. Um, and so I did it and, and, you know, made these, these rings around all the chairs and it, you know, created yet another context, another reason for these things and another poetic, um, which I thought was really exciting. Um, but with the, with the yeah. gallery, while we were doing that, there, there were, you know, total uprising and protests um, around the country and the world. And, you know, here we have this like um, army of sort of uh, what, what we ended up, what I'm calling them now is cognitive dissidents, um, the iced coffees. And so like, we, that's when it started is in, the, in that space, like us stepping over them, making them um, and, and then Hollis walking through it for this video, um, it kind of helped us understand what they were. I, I would add to that, like in this context, because they were material, but we were lacking like people and community. And I think community is often our material too, like our, our, our people. Um, they, it, I think it just underscored this feeling of like loneliness. Like I don't have any humans to play with, but here's this, like massive, of art objects like i'll see what happens there i thought that um the exhibition grace grace is speaking of um 
was a beautiful exhibition. And if you do not follow um, either Grayson or Hollis uh, via social media, if you want to see the context that was created, uh, Grayson Hollis, what, what would be the best place to see images of the installation? Would it be your Instagram accounts or the gallery website? Oh, of this recent show? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, on websites, Instagram, um, but there's also this beautiful review in the Brooklyn Rail um, that has only one photograph of the show, but um, a really nice interpretation of the show in the Brooklyn Rail, which, um, you know, we can make sure to share. But yeah, we have images on social media and um, on web website as well. Yeah, it was a great show. Congrats uh, to you, Grace, for that show and uh, to Hollis yes. for showing the video work. And you know, personally speaking, I just, I, you know, when I first saw the view, uh, the video, the performance after it was completed, found it to be very powerful and moving. Um, you know, I, I, coming in with my own experiences, um, understanding sort of the context in which the work was, was created. Uh, knowing that you collaborated with our, our students. Um, so, you know, thank you so much, you know, for the work. Um, you know, if we don't have any other questions, uh, any other comments from anybody um, tuning in, um, I don't know if, um, Hollis, you have anything else you would like to say about the performance in the video work? Yeah, I, I just wanted to like extra thank Emily because I even even having shot the piece with Grayson and even having uh, recorded the audio of the text um, and gathered the, you know, the music my daughter made. Um, I don't know that I would have been as motivated to sort of make it happen and to shape it. And that's that's why video and film has like always been such a cool um, collaborative context for me and why I love it is because and why also why I hate it because I can't do it all myself <laughs> but Emily just like um, made it happen and she really we had so many conversations right we had so many conversations about meaning because because everything changed when you match up the words and the visuals and there were so many like little things that felt really precious to me that we had to throw away or so many things that I had never thought of that she brought to the table um, so the whole piece, I think, really sung. So I don't know, Emily, if you want to say anything, but I just, um, you know, yeah, so, yeah. so I mean, grateful. It, it was, for me, just so nice to have a creative outlet to work on during all of this. And it's the first time I've ever worked completely digitally. I mean, we would once in a while see each other from five galleries away in the museum, but... You know, and I was just, you know, when you invited me to come on board, it was already written and you guys had shot all the footage. So I kind of just got to take all of these things and start weaving them together with you. And I think it's pretty amazing what we can do with technology, even in, you know, in such a creative way that, you know, we, we work together from thousands of miles apart to never in the same room together. <laughs> so, and I just want to say thank you to all the students. I had actually no idea which students were involved until we did the credits at the very end. And it was just, so I was just, anyway, really blown away by your words. And I found them all just so relatable to what we are all feeling right now and in that moment. So... Yeah, thank you for trusting me with the work. I, I really enjoyed working on it. And of course, now I watch it and I'm like, oh, but we could still do this. And there's this. <laughs> Sometimes you have to call it done. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yes. And it's, it's going into another show. All right, so we can expect uh, maybe like a two hour feature to come. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Using all the discarded footage, we'll make it happen. <laughs> Uh, I just want to point out in the chat section, uh, we have the link to the Brooklyn Rail article of the exhibition. Um, Portland-based artist and educator Ben Buswell has uh, written, as a college teacher, I want to say that it is great that you were all able to work together, uh, hyphen apart, 
Art will find a way, exclamation point. And also a comment from Tabitha. I really enjoyed the coffee cup circles at the show. Seeing how the coffee cups evolved was amazing. Thank you, Hollis and Grayson, for the experience, all in exclamation points. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Seriously. Yes, sorry. Oh, I just wanted to say, I, I, I want to give a lot of credit to Winnie, too, like just what she created in the museum. And I had the honor of hearing all of her words and all her different songs. And it was so hard to choose which one we use, but she's mm -hmm. a pretty magical human. And so thanks for sharing her with us, too. <laughs> Yeah, it was a real family effort there. And, and that, again, like, you know, her just improvising and processing, that was just like real time processing. I think I recorded that secretly on my iPhone when she was going to bed one night and she's just singing. And it was like, oh my God, we have to. I didn't know I was going to use it, but I just think it's perfect because it really was like a, a little, we were a little pod there. And uh, for those of you that do not know, uh, Winnie is Hollis and Grayson's six-year-old daughter. Yeah. And the Schneider Museum, you know, really took care of us during that time. So, you know, we really, all three of us felt like, you know, we were in a new place all of a sudden, and it was during a really difficult and scary time. And it, we felt like protected by a residency, which was very powerful um, experience. and you know, the, it's really personal when you have a, a six-year-old with you and everything. And so it was a super incredible and powerful time. Yeah. And we're thankful. Any last um, thoughts, comments, or questions from anybody on the call? If not, Hollis, um, applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and talking through it. It's really, really nice to be able to reflect with everyone. Sure. And if there's anybody uh, on this who um, might have questions later, they could find you online and shoot you an email. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just my name at Gmail. Okay. Thank you, Hollis. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, Till next time.